Tommy Gibbons, and today I'm going to talk to you about hemp building in the United States, where we are, and more importantly, where we're going. The good news is the fairly short history here. Hemp was only legalized in the United States in December of 2018. Last year was the first federally legal growth season. But more importantly, I want to talk about this industry's very, very bright and rapidly developing future. And I want to invite you all to become a part of it for the personal benefit of your business, for the homes that you'll be living in, and for our collective environment that we're all gonna to share together. So before starting, I wanna acknowledge that we are all here with great risk, right? And that shouldn't be news to anyone who's been hearing about what's going on in this world. And maybe that comes naturally to us because we're in the construction industry and we know that every day on the job site contains some risk. But I truly encourage us to be as cautious and sanitary as possible in the next few days. I personally want to normalize doing things other than handshaking, whether it's foot taps or, or elbows. Um, and I would have made this trip if I didn't think this message was so important to share that it's worth the risk that we're all putting ourselves in. But I want to offer a counterpoint to our viral world that we're living in. Because as we watch this foreign disease get flung to different corners of our earth and infect the population and the people there, I want to introduce another aspect of virality and the idea that good ideas can also be viral and they need to be viral. And we go to conferences and we go to meetings and networking and gathering and yes, we can swap diseases there, but this is where we exchange new and important and good ideas and it's fundamental. And so, you know, I believe once we find the vaccine to what's going on out there, it's gonna spread much faster than the disease did itself. And we all owe it to the people in the health professional fields who are working on this cure and working on taking care of the people doing work that us in the construction industry we can't do so our brothers and sisters who are working on this you know that's a problem that we're not capable of solving but hopefully we will solve problems like healthy buildings and healthy environments for them to live in so here's an idea and today i'm going to infect you with this special seed of an idea that our buildings will be better built better for inhabitants and immensely better for our environment if they are built from plants and we're talking about plants that are easily domesticated, soil enriching, and can be grown all across our United States and other countries with similar climates. Now I get people who email me every day acknowledging the potential of what we're doing at Hemp Protection in the promotion of hemp-based building materials. Just this week, a man told me that this could be the lungs of our planet if we make building materials from naturally recurring renewable plants. And I get that encouragement because they see me and they think I'm young and I'm corporate bred compared to a lot of people in the hemp industry. And I'll be able to go and represent ourselves to people like you, people who are actually making construction decisions on projects all over the United States. And I hope we can be a part of this change. I'm still not 30, and in my lifetime, I've seen huge amounts of change. And I want to talk about three particular industries that have changed before we even start talking about building materials. So here's one power and energy. We've seen the United States, the United States shift from coal and natural gas to renewables. You know, I, I attribute this to the CO2 revolution, you know, the common sense that we can't just be burning CO2 into our atmosphere without repercussions. But your home, you won't know if you're powered by clean or dirty energy. It will likely make no sense to you or no difference to your indoor climate. And so it wasn't necessarily a hard choice to make. It was mostly led by companies who wanted to go renewable, wanted to show some type of green stewardship, but they knew the consumers weren't going to have to, end, have to go through a different product. This is a more telling development. The vehicle revolution. Just in the past 15 years, we've seen our world go from combustible engines to the introduction of electric cars on a widespread scale. Now, it's a clean energy revolution, but it's an even bigger step because this one was driven by the consumer. And there were huge advantages to the combustion engine, right? There's mechanics that know how to work on these motors. There's gas stations and infrastructure that's developed to service them. You know, the whole charging of the deal with electric cars is something that needs to be built, needs to be created, needs to be changed and moved away from. But this next change that happened even more recently and is even more consumer driven, I think is an indication of where the world is going even further. Let's see if you guys' guesses can be proved correct. Right, our diets. So we've changed it from meats and dairy to plants. And this is the most interesting switch because if you're like me, it was a big sacrifice. Meat tastes good. Cheese, which I still eat, tastes good. 
but we see more and more young people, celebrities, cultural trendsetters, and people every day making this switch. So what is happening? Why is this, this huge shift taking place in our society and companies like Tesla and Beyond Meat seeing their market capitalizations grow, 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 uh, while these old technologies that are dirty are being left behind? Well, what's happening is what I like to call the green awakening. It's spreading, and where is it spreading? It's amongst the young people that will be living on this earth for the future. It's amongst the people who are trying to be leadership and thought leaders about the materials that we use and influencing and pressuring other people to adopt new strategies and be early adopters. So what industries are going to be next? Well, what about building, right? We talk about energy use, we talk about transportation, we talk about manufacturing, food production, but what standard do we hold ourselves to when we talk about buildings? We scoff at someone who drives a Hummer, but do we call out someone who builds their building completely out of concrete? Probably not yet, probably soon. Well, here's the dirty little secret. 40% of our energy and carbon footprint comes from buildings, right? So that outsizes industry, that outsizes transportation. It's basically the biggest sector of our economy. And it's so important because what we've heard so recently about green building is a little bit of a lie or a partially told truth. We equate green building to buildings that are operationally efficient, high R value insulation, high performance windows, you know, it passes the blower test at the door so that the air does not escape. That takes no consideration into the composition of the materials used to build that building. If those buildings have a huge carbon footprint and need to be extracted from minerals, if they needed to be highly processed or shipped from a foreign overseas source, they are going to contribute to the greenhouse gas pollutions in our environment. So one of the most important questions we can ask is not just how do your building materials perform, how do they behave after their lifespan? Are they going to landfill or are they biodegradable? Are they made from materials that can be rapidly renewed or are they from depleting resources? So we're gonna talk about hemp-based building materials and what you can do with materials that are made from a, a, the by byproduct of a plant that can be grown on a renewable basis. So our first material is hempcrete. This was the largest hempcrete house built in the United States in the summer of 2018 in Bellingham, Washington. Let's go ahead and roll the video and start talking about it. And it was an undertaking. I was on this job site. It took eight weeks. You can see it there with a plaster finish. You know, keep watching this video and I'll walk us through hempcrete and how it behaves. There it is before it's plastered. There's me working the mixer. This was all mixed and cast on site. So you were talking about CMUs and prefabricated building products. Hempcrete is a raw material that was mixed on site as recently as a year ago. You put it in a concrete iron pan mixer, you're adding some type of limestone mortar to the shims of the hemp plant, and what you're getting is an insulating wall infill material that actually is made up of predominantly plant carbon. Now you take that material, just moving it around a job site is a huge, huge undertaking, and you're packing it in between floor boards to make walls. Now the, the bucket for games you see here is kind of an outdated mode of installing hemstream. And our company is undertaking ways to improve not only the materials used, but also the labor efficiency of a hemstream project. That includes things from prefabricated hemstream insulation blocks to spray applied hemstream like you would spray in other insulation products or even spray in shock cream or something similar to that. If you're interested in seeing a look at our machinery, we invite you to our dome just across the street. We'll be there all week showing off these materials. Now, the thing about hempcrete is it's destined to be a little bit of a cottage industry. We're dealing with 12 inch thick mass walls um, that are great at hydro hydrothermic regulation of a building, but not necessarily the fastest way to install materials on a house. And we know that for adoption of new materials, there cannot be hurdles like increased time, waiting for these materials to cure before finishing with plaster. Um, or hiring crews that don't know how to deal with hempcrete on a job site. So even though this is you know, the top 1% of sustainable building materials, you're talking about passive walls that have great thermal mass, continuous insulation to eliminate thermal bridging, that can you know, passively heat and cool your house as the, as the day cycles fluctuate from heating and cooling. Um, but it's not quite there yet to be put into every single job site in the United States. So we developed something that is. And this is called hemp wool. Now hemp wool is an insulation product made from the fibers of the hemp plant. 
And what I've got right here is hemp biomass. And there's something pretty special about hemp biomass because it's very readily available in the United States. Who here knows what CBD is? Show of hands. Yeah. And who here knew what hempcrete was? Crickets. Our employee, great. <laughs> so CBD biomass is being grown all over the United States and this is a huge development in our industry. The idea that, okay, we can take this plant that has been grown for its flower for medicinal and food purposes and take what's basically a, a waste product, a waste stream of the processing, and we can turn it into two very important insulation products. The inner wooden core can be chopped up to make an aggregate for hempcrete, and the fibers, which transport the water up and down the plant, can be turned into a fiber bat insulation product called hemp wool. Let's run that video. This is a project we did for an Olsen Kundig design for a very high-end net worth client. Um, in, La in Venice Beach, California. It is a 3,200 square foot house. We insulated it both interior and exterior walls with hemp wool. The benefits of using hemp wool is it fits directly between standard stud construction. Its R value is R 3.7 per inch, which is identical to fiberglass insulation. It has a class A fire rating. It's non-toxic. It doesn't emit any VOCs. It's mold, pest, and rodent resistant and it is long lasting and durable. And then at the time when you're deciding to destroy your building and, and create something new, it can be thrown into a landfill or completely de uh, degrade and decompose. So we view this material as an important step in our industry because it's gonna be the first introduction of a hemp-based building material to a lot of construction projects. We don't think that it ends with hempcrete. We don't think that it ends with hemp wool. I expect in the near future, we'll have structural hemp-based building products We'll have wall sheeting boards and fiber boards made from hemp materials. We'll have hemp siding, we'll have hemp flooring. There's already a factory in Kentucky that's producing something called hemp wood that I encourage you all to check out. But it is a very rapidly developing industry. And what it's gonna take is a few things. One is there needs to be farming. Right now we import our hemp from an overseas partner, Canada, I mean they're not overseas, they're over a border though. And there are no local farmers that are producing this in the quantity and specification that we need. More importantly, there are no processors yet. So when you take the raw biomass and you want to turn it into building products that are ready to go onto a job site, it needs to be processed. Those investments and those facilities are coming in more and more every day. We hear people looking for information how to become a processor, looking to partner with us to be an end purchaser of their goods. It's something that I know is going to happen in the next five to six years. The good news is we already have demand for these products. We get asked to be on more hempcrete job sites than we could feasibly do in a year. We spend more of our time now teaching other builders so that they can bring these installation methods to their construction practices located all over the United States. And we have orders for hemp wool that exceed our current inventory. It's, a, it's an installation product that with basically no marketing has spread through the green building community almost instantaneously. So we don't know where this is gonna go. Probably the question you guys have is how does this cost relative to general installation products? How much is someone gonna feasibly pay for something that they won't be able to see inside of their walls? Well, right now, hemp wool retails for roughly 13 to 15% more than mineral wool. So that is our nearest substitute. It's cheaper than sheep's wool. It's cheaper than chopping up denim blue jeans and putting them in your, in your building, which is considered another green installation method for some reason. And we truly don't know where that price is gonna bottom at. Like I said, this is from an overseas manufacturer. Pretty soon we'll have domestic production using locally grown domestic hemp as a feedstock for all of these insulation materials. And where that price floor is, considering this is a waste product of a plant that's already being grown and massed in the United States, we truly don't know. We expect it to get lower and lower each year. So I'm gonna stop there. I think I gave you guys a lot of new information about building materials that I, I pulled the room a little bit before I got up here. It sounds like it's something that's completely new and that's great. I want you guys to have questions. I want you guys to come by, visit, and speak with me. If you want to get in touch and hear about what we're doing, get involved and be a partner of ours, please reach out to our email. Um, we know it's going to take a movement. It's going to take this idea of getting to more and more people. And so I encourage you to spread what you heard today, spread the link of this video, and um, Let's make a revolution happen.
is that compared with other plant waste material from grains and corn and stuff like that? Great question. So hempcrete is, first of all, it's a little bit of a misnomer because right, we're not dealing with a structural concrete product. We're dealing with insulation slash infill. And it absolutely can come from different plant materials. Kanat is a viable plant. Flax is a viable plant that produces a lot of herb fiber. Sunflower is about a viable plant. There is a, a buzz and a zeitgeist around hemp right now that makes sense to kind of use as a catalyst to getting these materials in front of a lot of people. But the possibility of rice, rice stalks can be used, corn can be used. Um, you know, using plants for building materials is, is a huge Pandora's box that we haven't even opened yet. So absolutely other building materials can be used. All right, I must have covered a lot of ground then. All right, well, thank you guys for coming again. We'll be in that dome all week. Come by, have questions, and I, I really encourage you to take a tour of that.